seeds are the starting point of any crop. You can have the perfect land, soils and growing conditions, the perfect climate and all the agri-tech that you need in your barn. But without a seed, you're not going to produce anything. And that's what we're talking about today. With more and more mouths to feed and fewer resources to work with, we still need to put food on the table. And our journey to resilience begins with the seeds. Healthy seeds is the starting point of, of healthy plants and the seed applied technology is of added value in this endeavor, joint endeavor with the farmers. Seed treatment, that's not only a topic for corn or maize. No, that's a topic for wheat, that's a topic for soybean, that's a topic for sorghum, that's a topic for rice, for millet, for vegetables, onions, tomatoes. You see the diverse range. Yeah, I think it's a science and an art. And sometimes I say it's a fairy tale that it all works so well together but it does. My name is Jane Craigie. I'm an agriculturalist, a traveler and a marketer. And today we're going to hit you with some amazing facts that will stop you in your tracks as we take you deep into the world of seed treatments. My knowledge of seed treatments is fairly limited and so I'm going to speak to someone I know to get the basics before I get started. Hi Tom, lovely to see you. How are you? Very well, thank you Jane. And yourself? For everybody listening, I am with Tom Allen Stevens and Tom is a farmer and also an arable journalist with a lot of interest in technical aspects of producing crops. Tom is the perfect person to tell us a little bit about seed treatments. So Tom, what do we need to know about seed treatments? It's an element of protecting the crop. So when you put the crop into the ground, it's one of the most important parts of uh, your crop performance. You need to do everything you can to get a successful establishment. That's what the farmer's after. And a seed treatment is an incredibly important part of that because there are so many bugs and various uh, fungi and so on that can destroy the seed. Uh, and if you haven't protected it, uh, then it, it can very quickly just kill the whole seed and you've lost your seed you've lost your plant you can treat the seed and treat a very very small part of the field uh, with a very very small amount of, of chemical um, and that protects your entire crop you know you cannot get more precise than that I think it's something like you know is it 80% of your productivity is decided in that first week when you establish your crop a, a, a crop well sown is well grown it's, it's so important to get that initial Initial establishment uh, absolutely correct. So today it's a curveball, but nonetheless vital part of farming. And we're going right back to the start of the process. To eat the salad in our bowls, we need to grow the salad. And in order to grow the salad, we need a successful cultivation of a crop. But before that cultivation is germination, the very first process that kicks the whole growing of the crop off. And it's vital. Farmers have a whole range of tools at their fingertips to provide optimum growing conditions for their crops. But many of these safeguards are for the crop once it's growing. The hard work of the farmer actually begins way before then, ensuring that the seeds have the best chance to actually germinate and push through the soil to access the nutrients that they need to grow into a healthy crop. And that's what we're talking about today. Get this stage wrong when you sow and there'll be no harvest and subsequently no food. As we explore the world of seed treatments, things could get technical. And so luckily I'm joined by some expert thinkers in the area. And the first expert is Jennifer Riggs. Jennifer works in research and development for BASF in the seed treatment team. With a career in seeds covering nearly 30 years, she really is the authority that we need. I don't think very many people in their life wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to be a seed treatment scientist. I guess I grew up around farming, and I was always very interested in, in plants. I think my real interest, though, in seed treatments came from me really understanding a little bit more about plant breeding and recognizing how... Along the way, most of the plants that we think about today, like corn, soybeans, even some of our fruits and vegetables, they were all wild once upon a time in nature. And we decided to uh, manipulate them so they do things outside what they would naturally do in the wild. We make them produce more corn or we make them grow faster. And what really intrigued me was when I think about a teeny tiny seed, they're like small 
living entities like a baby. And when I started thinking about how, what we were doing to the seed through our natural breeding, and now today with some of our genetically modified, I recognize that a seed has only a little bit of energy in it to start to grow a plant. And plants that can sometimes be 10 feet tall and feed our world, people and our animals and clothe us. And I started thinking about when we started manipulating them, we were actually taking that energy and focusing it somewhere else. And I recognize when you channel that energy somewhere else, you're giving something else up. And in the case of seeds, for a lot of time, we were giving up their ability to defend themselves in nature. So their defense mechanisms were being altered by taking energy away from that. And I felt like seed treatment, what we were doing and applying to protect against diseases and insects, gave back a little bit to that seed that what we took away from it. Now, Jennifer is perfect for this episode, as she has a very clear way of taking a complex issue and making it easy to comprehend. Seed treatments are products that are applied to the surface of a seed that do various different things. So some of them control pests, they control diseases, some of them control insects. Some things we apply to the surface of the seed, considered seed treatments, are products that help promote germination or early plant growth of that seed as it germinates. And the small seeds that contain so much promise to fill not just our salad bowls with delicious produce, but hold the key to keeping people alive. Face attack from every angle. There are insects that love to just chew away on the seed. There are fungi. They are pathogens, so they do damage the seed. A lot of times, uh, these things don't want to really kill or eat the entire seed because then they don't have a food source in the environment any longer. They have to go find something somewhere else. And microbes can't move very far. They're not like you and I that have cars. But yeah, there's insects, there's fungi, there's bacteria that what I would consider eat the seed. And then there are the nematodes, tiny, tiny worms that are pretty incredible. You can have good and bad nematodes. The bad ones do damage to agricultural crops, but there are so many of them. In fact, one mind-blowing fact for you, four out of every five animals on the planet, because nematodes are classed as animals, are nematodes. Nematodes can't survive without the plant. They can't feed, they can't reproduce, so they cause damage to the plant. As they take nutrients away from the plant, they reproduce in the plant and they produce galling and things. But if they actually killed the plant, they would actually be killing themselves. So while they damage it, I wouldn't say they eat it, but they do certainly cause significant damage versus an insect like a wireworm who actually will chew through the seed, bury itself in that seed and cause it to completely quit growing. So Jennifer has outlined some of the threats that seeds face. So how do the seed treatments protect the seeds? I think most people are familiar with an M&M that has the coating on the outside and protects it, the chocolate on the inside from melting in your hand. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that type of barrier protection, although there may be some bit of that. Um, it really depends on what the, the components of the seed treatment are. I mentioned a worm burying itself into a seed. If as it chews on that seed and then ingests it, they're actually toxic. There are other seed insecticides that we apply to the seed that are anti-feeding, so they don't like the way they taste, so they quit eating on the plant. Fungi are really unique in that um, it takes different types of fungicide depending on the fungus you're trying to control. Thus, the reason we put so many different fungicides on the seed surface, but they're the same. Some of them actually cause death to the fungi. Some of them are anti anti-feeding, again, they're protectants. We do apply things like a seed coating to the surface of the seed and those type of products. In the most case, we don't think of them as a protectant, but what they are able to do is they do protect that seed by keeping all the products on the seed where we need them to be, to be able to do 
what their roles are, whether that's protecting against an insect or protecting against a nematode or providing that plant growth promotion. So I guess from that standpoint, the seed coating does provide that type of barrier, just protecting those products that we're putting on the seed that they stay where we need them to be. So what about the origins of seed treatments? From very simple, even primitive methods, a very complex science has evolved. But obviously, the first seed treatments were being applied several centuries before Jennifer began her toils. The science dates back a long, long time. But what made farmers and traders first take notice was when a ship was wrecked in Bristol Harbour in England in 1670. Here's historian Nicola Cannon from the Royal Agricultural University, based in Gloucestershire, England. There was a shipwreck off Bristol and the boat was full of wheat and it was close enough to shore that um, people went out and collected the wheat off the boat. They found it wasn't particularly good for milling. They decided to sow it. When they sowed the wheat, they found that it did far better than the normal seed that they saved and sowed for producing wheat crops. The main reason this is thought to be is because it reduced the risk of bunt and smut in the crop. Therefore, it was growing more cleanly. For the uninitiated, bunt and smut are fungal infections in wheat. Grain contaminated with bunt spores has a darkened appearance and gives off a really pungent, fishy smell. Hence the name stinking smut. Common bunt the other disease I mentioned, reduces both grain quality and yield. People came out with this theory that it was because of the salt water, the brine washing, that it, it helped the seed grow. So then people started briming seeds to reduce the risk for the crop they were growing. Probably some of the benefit that they were receiving was just from washing the seed to get off any um, spores that were sitting on the outside of the seed. And this has been refined much more as time's gone through. And obviously we don't uh, soak um, crops in seawater now or in salt. The timelines can start in BC period if you talk about the first kind of manipulation of of seed right from the Romans using products um, such as ground up olive waste and putting it on plants to try and biologically protect them. Also kind of hot water washing over time. In the kind of early 1900s, which was obviously um, in an industrial era, there was a lot of experimentation with things like coal tar and tobacco, heavy metals and things like this to try and encourage greater seed vigour and health. Most of them were unsuccessful and mercury came out as a kind of more successful product and that stayed in as a seed treatment for for many years but it did lose favor post the second world war when we saw the discovery of organochlorides these were the first kind of um, synthetic seed dressings and they were quite widely adopted and used up until the 1970s they were very effective at killing pests but they were very very persistent and uh, were found throughout ecosystems to um, have caused toxicity in mammals and birds as well as existing in everything so they were kind of phased out but one of the really important aspects with um, seed dressings and coatings and treatments is um, to get 100% you know, coverage. Hot water is still used in lots of vegetable seed production today as a treatment and very carefully controlled and the seed is dried out afterwards. But seed treatments don't solely protect the seeds from bugs and fungi and anything else trying to munch on it. Many of the seed dressings applied today are not just for controlling disease or pests, but they're for giving a kind of micronutrient burst to that little package of seed to give it a good start to enable it to root and grow successfully. And again, that get that good crop establishment. The International Seed Federation is the voice of the private sector. They are completely independent, but act as a representative of nearly 7,500 seed companies around the world. 
These range from family-owned businesses to huge regional businesses, cooperatives and multinationals, and everything in between, and cover a whole diversity in terms of the range of crops, from field crops to vegetables, from forage to turf crops. Michael Keller is the Secretary General, and we spoke on the eve of the annual ISF conference, held virtually once again as a result of COVID-19. Healthy seeds is the starting point of, of healthy plants. Seed applied technologies, it's absolutely complementary to what we, the seed people, are doing. And together, if you see what it can help to do in terms of agronomic benefits, in terms of targeted protection for the seed in the fields, but also in terms of less costs for the farmer because he has not to use spraying afterwards or things like this. You know, there are so much diverse range of added value you can have when you get the seed plus the protection through seed treatments into the arms of the farmers to help the farmers to grow the plant healthy plant it's all about collaboration you need to get the right seed you need to get the right variety to the farmers and um, seed companies are working together with providers of seed blight technologies or seed treatments to build this right angle of protection of the seed for the farmer because this is not something you can decide in an office based somewhere this needs to be done together in the fields you need to work it out you need to to ensure sure somehow that the yield you get out is not impacted from anything and, and this is therefore a collaborative approach because at the end it's up to the farmer to make the choice and the farmer needs to have the choice of the best possible protection he's looking for what he's putting in the field the seed people the breeders are trying to find the best way to bring seeds which are resistant to pests and diseases to the farmers around the world. And that collaboration has played a key role in the recent months. Faced with the global lockdown as we tackled COVID-19, it was vital to safeguard food supplies. And seeds obviously play an important role in doing this. Remember back some months back, we had a situation where we faced closed borders. And this was just some weeks ahead of the planting season in the northern hemisphere. And if you don't get the seed in the hands of the farmer at the right moment, the output is impacted. Therefore, there was a tremendous effort to work together. From the beginning, food production was recognized as essential. That means borders somehow um, were not closed, where the border restrictions were lifted. And within this, seed could continue to move. We showed our resilience, our capacity to somehow even in this so difficult situation to be able to bring the seeds to the farmers but this could not have been done without a trustful relationship with national governments but also international organizations and at the same time we are also learning the world is not standing still the world is moving with such a huge industry and farmers of all scale across the globe it comes as no surprise that the ISF works closely with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, something Michael was keen to highlight. We want to make quality seed accessible to all farmers. What is in the FAO's motto? Motto is um, Fiat Panis, that means let there be bread. What this means is also, hey, how to ensure that there is no hunger and how to ensure food security. In several countries in Africa, still, we have an issue to provide seed choice to farmers. You can imagine a, a smallholder farmer, for instance, in Africa, who used since his grandfather's times the same varieties. They need to get also feeling what could it mean to have perhaps a choice that means improved varieties or even treated uh, varieties. And that's where we are thinking to build trials together, to make the people feeling, understanding what it means. COVID-19, one of the things happened, we have an increased issue with hunger. We have 60 or 70 million more people who are suffering from hunger than last year. It's first time since many years. That means there is an issue with producing enough food. And there is also an issue in, in producing also nutritious food because it's about us. 
It's about you, me, everywhere. What can we do in our fight against hunger? What can we do in our engagement to increase livelihood um, of farmers around the world? What can we do for the well-being of people? That means when you think on all the breeding efforts also in vegetables, you see vegetables consumption is increasing, increasing, increasing. And, and, and the efforts here from, from the private seed sector engaged in a vegetable is tremendous. And I think therefore I'm proud to, to be in such an innovative sector. But we want to hear more. The three crops most susceptible to attack are wheat, corn and soy. We wanted to bring you a real flavour of the way in which these crops are grown around the world, the challenges farmers face and what solutions they have in their armoury. We're going to hear from three parts of the world, Australia, Brazil and our first stop, North America. Meet Doug and Nick. Doug Greeson farms in Iowa, growing corn and soybeans on 600 acres of ground. And Nick Tinsley is from BASF, and he's the go-to guy for the seed treatments that Doug relies on. We started farming in 1996. In our area, it's been the cool and wet Mays and June that have given us the most problems. In the 21st century, you don't plant without great seed treatments. The margins are too thin to give up stan, which means giving up profitability. If you don't control the pest, you lose stand, and that translates into lower yields. My name is Nick Tinsley, and I am a seed treatment technical representative with BSF. I cover a territory that is essentially the eastern half of the northern United States. The pests and diseases over that large land mass can be quite varied. It's important to understand what the driving problems are in any given field. And, and certainly there are some that I run across a lot, uh, but then you could cross state lines and all of a sudden, you know, a different soil type means that there's gonna be a different kind of pest. You know, starting with insects. When we're talking about seed treatments, we're really talking about insects that can attack the seeds or those small seedlings right after they germinate. Unfortunately, a lot of them are subterranean. They're very difficult to scout for, and so seed treatments really represent a great tool for managing those types of insects. Moving into the world of diseases, the challenge with these types of problems is that the environmental conditions are so important to determining which diseases are going to be prevalent in any given year. If it's hot and dry, those are going to be different diseases than if it's cold and wet. And so these are things that can be very difficult to predict uh, for growers. Finally, moving into nematodes, one of the challenges with nematodes is that they're so small, they can almost go undetected. You might have a grower uh, that is experiencing yield loss that doesn't even know that that yield loss is going on. And so in some cases with nematodes, it's an awareness issue. Part of the problem with a lot of these uh, insects and diseases and nematodes is the unpredictability of them. We have a lot of great tools that growers can use to help protect their acres. Um, but certainly this is a kind of a long war if you think about it that way. We use Poncho Votivo 2.0 and Obvious Plus. These products work great for all operations, no-till, minimum till, or conventional till. These products now are starting to move beyond just protecting against loss and actually improving yield in some um, demonstrable way. And I think that's a, an important part of the picture. And occasionally I do get the pleasure of interacting with farmers and I can tell you um, trust can be a hard won and earned with those guys and for good reason. You know, these folks are putting their, uh, you know, every, their investment every year out in the field and it's your job to help protect that. Heading south, we meet GM Bordini. He's a sales rep for BSF in Mato Grosso do Sul in Brazil. But first, we hear from a farmer he works with. Hi, everybody. Here's Jarbas Neto from Brazil. We are growing in south, the state of Paraná. We are growing 5,500 acres, soybeans, cotton, corn, potatoes. The moment of seed planting is the most important phase for the success of the crop. That's the production of potential of the crop can be exploited to the fullest. During the germination in such a tropical place, we have two major treats. 
One is the bugs attacked to the cotyledon, and also, as hot as it gets, we have burn issues to the hypocotyl that later on can be a door open to diseases. We have bugs that attacks even from the root. Some bugs just eat the leaves, others just cause minor damage, but even the minor damage can be a door to the disease. Being present and taking into account the particularities of the farm is a fundamental practice to offer the correct product at the right time to the farmer, like fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, because good products also need to be aptly in the right times. I don't consider having a crop without the seed treatment because, as I said earlier, if you don't have the bugs, which we have a lot, you have disease, even a sunburn to the hypocotyl can make a door open to the diseases, so we use treatment to the seeds. I'm pretty sure I can help the legacy of the farmer. In other words, I can help to feed the planet. And finally, in Australia, Arturo de Lucas explains the challenges farmers in the Southern Hemisphere face. The farmer, the thing what they want to do is make sure that the seed comes out of the ground, and that's a very visual thing. Uh, and you want to make sure that the farmer uh, is looking at the crop coming out healthy. And I think we play an important role in that, um, trying to tackle um, a lot of those early diseases, uh, which are very important in, in having a, a healthy crop coming out of the ground. Most of our seed treatment products, uh, including Elevo, uh, go through seed companies. I mean, seed companies are a big driver of seed treatment use and adoption. So we work very closely uh, with those seed companies to understand the characteristics of their customers. A lot of the uh, the usage of products is is driven by agronomists that give support to farmers. So so we work and have places where we interact with both farmers, agronomists, and also obviously the retail, uh, to try to understand what are the challenges that they are facing, what's happening in the market uh, regarding crops, diseases, pests. Uh, in addition to that, I, I, I work closely with um, uh, what we call here in Australia seed graders. So seed graders go uh, from farm to farm cleaning seed. This happens both in, in cereals and a little bit in canola as well. They clean the seed before planting and also they are applying seed treatments uh, as they clean that seed. Working with them allow us to understand uh, what challenges and pests uh, some of those farmers are, are having and those challenges. Black leg in canola is, is, is the main disease. Um, and really the offering that there was uh, in the last years has pretty much been only one product that has caught a few different um, issues. Um, and then we had Elevo coming to the market uh, and, and at the same time, a competitor was launching a, a, sim a, a very similar product. So, so how we work with those customers of ours um, uh, provide information, tech support, what kind of value we could give to those farmers. So definitely the, the, the relationship you create has to go beyond the product. What's clear is that everyone involved in the seed treatment business is passionate about what they do, mainly as a result of their understanding that getting the seed right is the very first crucial step in farming. If the seed fails, then so does the crop and so does the farmer's livelihood. And the manufacturers are striving to create more effective, more precise and more sustainable products to push the science ever further. But what's around the corner? The big move at the moment now is in biostimulants and um, trying to find biological products generally, you know, looking at products that can stimulate healthy growth, but don't have long-term residue effects on the environment. It's about thinking about the whole system in how you grow the crop to enable the whole process to successfully happen.
I think there are so many things we don't even know today how far we can go. Blockchain is a topic, let's be clear. Digitalization for, for the movement of seed, for instance, is absolutely essential. We're still in the learning process, you know, um, but we are learning how to digitalize this, that, that the seed can move. You have your somehow your electronic passport and the seed is moving. We see the importance of seed supply chain. And perhaps in some years, we will have even the whole seed supply chain who can be, in a way, digitalized when it's come up to move it around the world. Day to day, day in, day out, we need to understand climate. Climate is changing. Again, we need to work with nature, a changing nature, but we can do it, but we can only do it together. And, and I think that's what I'm proud of, to see this engagement everywhere. When you have a sector which is sometimes spending 20, 25% of its turnover year by year in research and development, tell me another sector who is investing so much. You will not find it. Science is so important. And when you look how science is, is evolving, our, our capacities of, of breeding, that's tremendous opportunities um, ahead of us. And I think therefore, I'm proud to, to be in such an innovative um, sector. The greatest minds in seed technology are currently working hard to ensure that the planet has a ready supply of the best available seeds, using every ounce of technology available to them to try and feed a growing population. After all, without the seeds, farmers are unable to produce the foods we love so much and the crops that keep us alive.